So good morning, everybody. And, uh, welcome to the second lecture in the Prapa Gama class. Thank you. This uh, is the Institute of Psychology. Today we have with us Professor Miles Houston, who is a professor at the Oxford University. Before welcoming him formally, let me give you a allow me to give you a background to this lecture series, the Prapa Rama Karsi uh, lecture series. This is being sponsored by Professor Ramathar Singh, uh, who is an alumnus of uh, IIT Kanpur. He joined the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences uh, as an assistant professor of psychology in November 1973 and moved to IIM Ahmedabad as a professor in June 1979. Over an illustrious 54-year career, he also served at the Patna University, IIM Ahmedabad, National University of Singapore, and IIM Bangalore. He has been a distinguished university professor at Ahmedabad University since July 2016. In recognition of his exceptional and outstanding contributions to psychological sciences, he was elected Fellow of the British Psychological Society in 1992, American Psychological Association in 1993, Association for Psychological Science in 1993 and Society for Personality and Social Psychology and National Academy of Psychology in India in 2005. Ramathar Singh has publicly stated that his career might not have unfolded in such a gratifying way had he not started his postdoctoral career at IIT. He humbly acknowledges that most of his experimental studies at the levels of the individual group and society were possible because of the love and support of his wife, Pratha Singh, herself a development psychologist. Findings from her experimental research with children were published in Child Development, Cognitive Development, and Journal of Social Psychology. By hosting the Pratha and Ramatha Singh Distinguished Lecture in Psychology, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur, celebrates their sustained contributions to the advancement of psychology and management as a science in Asia. Uh, to introduce the speaker, I request Dr. Prakashi. We are pleased to welcome Professor Miles Houston. Uh, Miles obtained his DPhil from University of Oxford in Social Psychology in 1981 and did his postdoctoral work at Germany to obtain a habilitation in 1986. He is a renowned British social psychologist who has held chairs in social psychology at the University of Bristol, University of Mannheim, Germany, and Cardiff University before taking up a chair at the University of Oxford, where he was also a fellow of New College. He has been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, Stanford University. He has published widely in the field of experimental social psychology. His major topics of research have been attribution theory, social cognition, social influence, stereotyping, an intergroup conflict. He is a former editor of the British Journal of Social Psychology and co-founding editor of the European Review of Social Psychology. Miles is a fellow of the British Psychological Society, Society for Personality in Social Psychology, Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, British Academy and the Academy of Learned Societies for Social Sciences. He was conferred President's Award for Distinguished Contribution to Psychological Knowledge by the British Psychological Society in 2001 and the Podol Medal from the European Association of Social Psychology in 2014. With a series of books and research papers to his credit, Miles has been actively involved in public policy in Kutaskar. So welcome Miles and the floor is. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for those warm words and uh, what a pleasure and, and an honor it, it is for me to be here um, today. Just a, f a few words by, by way of introduction. First of all, to, to India. Um, this is my fourth visit to India um, and in some ways the least interesting because the first time I came here, I came here as a hippie in 1978 and it took me three weeks to travel here over land through a series of countries that you can no longer visit if you value your life shows how much the world has changed. Um, I joke when I say it's the least interesting because it's been a marvelous visit 
so gracefully hosted by Braj and meeting all these wonderful students. We had a fantastic session. At least I thought it was a fantastic session yesterday. I really enjoyed it. And it's a great honor um, to give this lecture in Ramadar's name. I'm going to wave hello to Ramadar because I'm hoping he's watching this on, on the webcam. And, and one of the things I'll say very briefly ab about him is when um, Minnie read out uh, the, the, so the details of his career, I realized how broad he has been. And I've looked at his CV in, in detail. He's really published on a, a huge number of topics. I actually had some fun looking him up on Google Scholar where it turns out that there are two R Sings on Google Scholar, one of whom has published papers on um, varieties of rice that grow particularly well um, and topics like that. And I presume that that's not Ramadar, although they're mixed in with topics and papers on psychology. I consider myself to have been a much narrower person. I've actually focused for the last 30 years pretty much intensively on the topic I'm going to talk to you about today. So what I've, I'm going to do, and this is in preparation for a, a, a book I've been asked to do, which is a, a look over my career and a collection of my papers, and I have to write an introduction. And I sort of thought to myself, well, what have I actually learned? What lessons have I learned? And I, I have extracted seven lessons. Um, and actually, just before I go into the lessons, I wanted to say my normal style is to ask you to interrupt me at any point that you wish to. I think that's not going to work so well today because people have classes to, to go to. Um, some people have classes to teach. So maybe it's best not to interrupt unless you have questions of fact, in which I think it's always important to, to interrupt. And then we'll have a, a question and answer session afterwards. So my seven lessons are, first of all, that we've got past the stage where we investigate whether intergroup contact changes outgroup attitudes. I'm going to tell you what I mean precisely by intergroup contact in a minute, but it's essentially the idea that you bring together members of different groups, that they have some contact or experience with each other, and as a result of that, their attitudes towards each other will improve. Now, some of the information that I'm going to present, some of the evidence, is by nature very technical. Those of you who come from faculties who are not used to dealing with that kind of information. I'm going to try and provide summaries away from the numbers that explain what I think is important about, uh, about the work that we've done. Those of you who are more nerd-like psychologists, you can ask me detailed questions about the data and the analysis and the theory when you want. The second lesson I've learned is that this idea of bringing people together doesn't just have direct and rather obvious effects. So when I say an obvious effect, if you go home and you talk to your relatives and you say, we listened to a, a lecture and this man told us that if only we'd meet each other, we'd get on better. And your elderly aunt or uncle says to you, that doesn't sound very profound to me. Well, what we're trying to do is open up the box and discover profundity and uh, learn more about the, the interesting ways in which contact may work. And it turns out that contact has some very important indirect and rather unexpected influences. And I can see assiduous students scribbling notes already. I will make a version of this talk available via Braj, which you can put on your server somewhere, so you don't need to scribble everything. Um, the third lesson. Contact helps explain the mixed effects of diversity. We are in a world where everybody is struggling with the topic of diversity. Some people present a rather negative view. Some people are more optimistic. And I will show you uh, some of the things that we have found out, which indicate a very important role for intergroup contact. Most of this research, for historical reasons that I will explain, has focused on positive contact. Of course, if you wanted to bring members of different groups together to improve intergroup relations, you wouldn't bring them together for negative contact. You bring them together for positive contact. But in a lesson that you can learn for your own research, you can sometimes say, am I taking a too one-eyed view of my topic? Am I focusing on the most obvious aspect? If I were to wind my clock back all these years to 1954 and Gordon Allport's classic work, I would say, oh, I wish I had thought about studying negative contact as well as positive contact much earlier. I've recently become a bit of a fan of social network analysis, and I don't know if there are 
people possibly in cognitive science who are interested in, in this technique, which I find an incredibly complex and detailed uh, approach, but one that is rich in the kind of information it can supply to us. It was almost uh, as if it were a technique invented for this area of study. Uh, I found it very useful. And I'm going to end up most broadly, first of all, by challenging some of the critics of contact theory. Those of you who are academics will know well that once somebody builds up a tower of knowledge in our discipline, the next important thing to do is to knock down the tower like a tower of Jenga and begin all over again. Well, I think that's good. That's how we learn. That's how we improve what, what we're doing. Um, I will show you some evidence in which we tested contact under the most challenging conditions, conditions where you would think, wow, I would really be impressed. This is like taking a drug which works well against a weak form of cancer, and then you say, well, let's try it against the most virulent forms of the disease. Is it effective then? And finally, I'll go back to the origins of contact theory, where it was presented as something that could be the basis for social interventions. Go into the real world, get out of the ivory tower, do something with your knowledge, and I'll show you some evidence that contact works, but it's cautious evidence because it's much, much more challenging to work in the real world. And that's why we should do it. In the famous words of Muzava Sharif, the social psychologist, I've tried in my career to go backwards and forwards between the laboratory and the real world, uh, which is particularly important if you live in a place like Oxford, which is a long, long way from the real world. In the beginning was Gordon Allport. 1954, he wrote this wonderful book, The Nature of Prejudice. It was such a special book. It was the kind of book that you would find for sale on railway stations and at airports. It was read widely by many, many people. As the great Mark Twain said, a classic is something everybody wants to have read and nobody wants to read. I suspect that's a, a quotation that uh, works quite well for the English department as well. Um, what is the contact hypothesis? It's this idea that positive contact with a member of another group, often a member of a negatively stereotyped group, can improve negative attitudes. Not only towards the specific members, which should be relatively easy to bring about. You get people together in a positive situation. You promote warmth and interaction and friendliness. But what we want to do, which we sometimes call the $64,000 question, is we, we want to generalize to the group as a whole. If I, as a Protestant from Belfast, Northern Ireland, come into positive contact with a Catholic from Belfast, Northern Ireland, I don't just want to make Edward more, f more friendly with Patrick. I want them to change their views of their groups as a whole. Allport's great work involved identifying the key, what he called optimal conditions for contact. When you bring groups together, you need to provide within the contact situation equal status, a situation in which stereotypes are disconfirmed, cooperation between the people present, a situation that allows participants to get to know each other properly, to get beyond the stereotypes, and you want norms that support equality between the groups. All of this, of course, is within the situation. It's not possible overnight to create those supportive norms outside the situation. Allport also looked at what we call mediators in psychology, the underlying processes that explain how contact would have its effects. And if you go back, and Allport is such a my goodness, it's wonderful here. You eat all the time. This is the main reason that, that I want to come back, except this is terribly unfair because you get to eat while I have to talk. <laughs> and if you go back, and I go back and I read Allport, I go back and I find new things in it, like, a, like you do in a, re, in a real classic. When you go back to read Moby Dick or you go back to read Charles Dickens, you find something in there that you didn't read on the previous reading. Allport says very little about how contact works, but where he does, he refers to improving knowledge about the group. One of the things that, that we have learned subsequently is that knowledge is not that important. It's much more important to develop feelings, positive feelings towards other people, and reduce negative feelings. And I will talk about some work that we've done on the mediators. So, 
especially for those of you who come from outside of psychology, uh, what is contact? Well, most of the work for the first 30 years, I would love to, sir, you're tempting me greatly, but I must, I must put it aside. Um, typically, the first 30 years focused on direct face-to-face -face contact. And we might think of this as the mere quantity of contact. How frequent are your interactions with out-group members? How often, for example, do you meet or talk to members of the out-group in school, at work, and so on? Next, there's the quality of contact. To what extent is that contact that you have friendly, unfriendly, positive, or negative? And probably the most important measure is cross-group friends. Having friends who belong to different social religious and ethnic groups from yourselves. And this is not me delivering a lesson that you go back and tell to your elderly aunt or uncle that this professor came and he told us that everything would all be okay if we made friends with each other. Look at Gaza, look at Israel today, and you can see that it's not that straightforward. Things take place with a very complex social and political nexus. But these are some of the things that we can do as social psychologists to build things up from the bottom. And the outcome in all of this research, the thing that we correlate with contact, the thing that we want contact to change, is that we want attitudes to change. We want trust to improve. We want to show that the views of outgroups have improved. Well, does contact help? to reduce prejudice. We don't have to spend long on that because since 2006, masterly meta-analysis by Pettigrew and Tropp has shown that there is a highly significant negative relationship between contact and prejudice. The overall effect size is what we would term statistically small. It has a greater effect, contact has a greater effect under all ports, um, optimal contact conditions. And as you would hope, the effect size is larger under rigorous studies. Those of you who've never read a meta-analysis, those of you who think you ought to learn about meta-analysis, even just because you want to learn about it because you read results in The Economist or Popular Science, this is a wonderful, wonderful paper to teach you about why uh, meta-analysis is important and how to use it. So the first lesson, go beyond whether contact works and investigate when and how it changes our group attitudes most effectively. I put the references here in passing for anybody who follows up the lecture and wants to know the references. Well, the first part of our work was to add a new moderator to all ports conditions. And this was the idea that when members of different groups come together, they shouldn't be seen and see each other as individuals, purely as individuals, but they should see each other as members of their respective outgroups. If they don't do that, then what you get is kind of cosmetic change. You get a change in the view of the individuals who are present, but you don't generalize that view to the outgroups as a whole. So this led to a rather paradoxical prediction that when you wanted to reduce prejudice, you still had to make sure that categories were present, that they were salient, and that you were meeting with each other as individuals who were to some extent typical of each other's groups. We showed this in one very simple study carried out with uh, colleagues in the Netherlands, where we created an interaction situation between Dutch students and a Turkish confederate. The Turks are a minority group quite highly re uh, represented uh, in the Netherlands. And in different parts of the interaction, an initial part and a second part, we did or we did not introduce comments that made the ethnic categories salient. So in one condition, low, low, we mentioned categories neither in the first part nor in the second. In the next condition, we mentioned categories only in the second part, and in the strong hyper condition, we started off by mentioning categories and we ended up by mentioning categories. And as you can see, generalization to your attitudes towards the outgroup in general are stronger in the conditions where you make typicality salient. It doesn't seem to matter whether you do it just once or whether you do it twice, but the key difference is emerging here 
between never mentioning categorization and introducing it at some point. We showed the same kind of thing in a later study where we were beginning our work on the mediators, the underlying processes. Now this is a cross-sectional study and all of us who were meeting just yesterday will think this is a weak study, it's correlation, it's a building block for a, a, the future. Uh, I'm sorry, I lose bits of my slides at the very top, but I don't think that we, we can do an, anything about that. I apologize. Um, so this is a cross-sectional, correlational study with, done with my dear friend Alberto Vocci, a long-time collaborator in Italy, where we showed that contact is associated with three outcome variables. At the top, perceiving the outgroup as being more variable. Secondly, having a more positive attitude towards that group. And thirdly, having a, having a, a subtle um, prejudiced view of the outgroup, a less obvious measure. And we can show that several of those effects are mediated through intergroup anxiety. Contact improves those outgroup attitudes and it improves subtle prejudice by lowering anxiety about meeting members of the outgroup. And what we can show is for two of those effects, the mediation effect of reduced anxiety is stronger when categories are made salient than when they are not made salient. This is what we call a moderated mediation. So we consider the two effects similar. I'm going to go through these studies quite quickly because they're all published and the ones that are not I will spend a bit more time on. I'm really extracting a sort of bird's eye view for you today of our progress over many years. Now, as we said yesterday, you need to do longitudinal work. You need to take the same individuals and follow them up over a period of time. And this is a study done with Hermann Swart, my former graduate student, still a collaborator of mine in South Africa. And we did a longitudinal study of what South Africans call colored students. You have the white South Africans, you have the black South Africans, and you have this intermediate group. Uh, that's a term that many people would find derogatory outside of South Africa. It's the term that is still used and is accepted <coughs> as a self-referent by members of that group. We collected data from kids in high school at three time points between the ages of 14 and 15. And we measured, first of all, contact, their cross-group friendships with members of the white outgroup. We measured affective mediators. We measured their anxiety and their empathy. And we measured various outcomes. We had outgroup attitudes. We had perceptions that the outgroup is variable. And we had negative action tendencies, like your inclination to avoid them or your inclination to be uh, aggressive towards them. Stellenbosch, the city, the town where we collected um, this data, is split, like many areas of South Africa, in this case into a very large prosperous white area, uh, a small black area, and two even smaller, thank you very much, uh, colored areas. This segregation, I'm sure, is also present in India. It's present in the United States, and it's very much present in the United Kingdom as well. These are global trends. These are not national trends. The same respective picture of segregation uh, is shown in a bird's eye or a drone's eye view. You can probably guess uh, without me telling you which side is occupied by the white South Africans and has swimming pools and which is occupied by closely, densely packed uh, a squatter camp of colored people. So what we did in the longitudinal study is we measured contact mediators and outcomes at three points in time. And what you do when you do a study like this is you measure each variable at each wave, but that creates such a spaghetti of crossed lines that I'm simplifying it for the presentation today. And what you can show is when you do that is you can show that contact at time one works through mediators at time two to bring about changes at time three. That was the first longitudinal test of contact mediating through affective variables. The second lesson is that contact has important indirect as well as direct effects. These are effects that really were not anticipated by Gordon Allport. We have a tendency 
in psychology, maybe it's a tendency in all uh, disciplines, but I think in psychology we, we tend to be a bit self-critical and we think, you know, uh, we, is our work good enough? We must go back to the classics. We must show that William James said this too, or that Gordon Allport said this too. Gordon Allport did say many wonderful things. He wrote beautifully, which is another reason to read him, because it's a really lovely book to read. But he didn't find out everything. We found out a lot since his time. And the first of, of these three indirect effects is what we now call extended contact. And it's the idea that simply knowing somebody who is a member of your group, who has a close relationship with somebody in the out group, can be a positive addition to reducing prejudice. Those of you who are, who are from the English department may be able to help me it w by, by thinking of literary sources in which this is, this is and the classic case, of course, is uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, where the, 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 the star-crossed lovers come together from their, their different groups, the Romulets and the Capulets. And the Capulets, that's right, thank you. Uh, and uh, you, you know what happens next. It, it creates... Um, a shitstorm, for want of a, a, a more polite expression. Um, West Side Story. West Side Story is a more recent version of that, and there are many other cases. Um, <clears throat> secondly, it was proposed that contact with one outgroup can change attitudes towards other groups. And this is a secondary transfer effect, which has only been much more recently considered a possibility. And the third idea is that contact may have a contextual effect, which is just living in an area, just occupying a social space where other people have on average higher levels of contact can make some contribution to reducing your level of prejudice. And I think of these things as a multiplier effect of direct contact. If you have a small number of people having positive contacts with other people, this can be viewed by other people, it can then be followed up in behavior by other people, it can trickle down towards other groups. And we found evidence for all three of these effects. It was Stephen Wright and his colleagues in 1997 who first talked about extended or second-hand co contact. So it, the, you are yourself are not involved in the contact. You're knowing about, or in some cases, observing someone who has contact. So think to yourself, how many of your family members, how many of your close friends might have out-group friends, and especially important is out-group friends from a group that you don't have friends in? Just knowing those other people can possibly help to improve your attitudes. When I read this paper, I thought it was highly unlikely that this could be true. It seemed impossible, and so I did what psychologists do. I set out, I did my own piece of research, and lo and behold, I found that this work had an effect. I did many, many studies. I, I learned more about how and when it works, and I even carried out a meta-analysis of the studies on this effect, and I'll share those results with you very briefly. So, in Wright's theory, he argued that this extended contact, knowing about somebody else's contact, works, first of all, by including the other in the self. There's a rather nice measure that he uses in his work of overlapping circles. You have a scale where they start off being apart and then they, they end up being almost completely overlapping. You're including that other person in your, your notion of yourself. It may work through outgroup norms. You learn that another member of the outgroup is behaving <laughs> positively towards another member of your group and you think, oh, they seem to be tolerant of us. They seem to be positive towards us. You have the same effect for the in-group. You watch another in-group member behaving positively towards the out-group, and you say, OK, there seems to be an in-group norm here. This is the way that we will behave towards these people. And when you look at social change that has happened in, globally in the last few years towards, for example, the rights and the recognition of gay people, black rights, all sorts of previously stigmatized social groups. You can see how these changes occur. And finally, intergroup anxiety, the idea that if you're not directly involved in the contact, but you merely observe somebody or know about somebody else who is having the contact, that should let you stand back with some degree of detachment and simply 
be aware that two members who belong to different categories are interacting positively and you're, there's no reason for you to be anxious about it. One of my former graduate students, uh, Rhiannon Turner, it's a rather lovely thing when you get to the end of your career to see your former students becoming professors, which I think makes me a meta-professor. Uh, and Rhiannon Turner is herself now a professor with a distinguished career. She did um, this wonderful study as part of her doctoral thesis with me where she showed that the opportunity for contact, just, just in principle being able to interact uh, with members of the out group, uh, is associated with having cross-group friends. And cross-group friends and extended contact are in turn connected with these possible mediators and uh, the criterion of outgroup attitudes. And the most important thing in this graph for us is that extended contact has a significant positive association in a correlational cross-sectional study with inclusion of the outgroup in the self, in-group norms, outgroup norms, and intergroup anxiety in just the way that Stephen Wright and his colleagues had predicted. So that was the first <coughs> test, confirmatory test of that theory. Extended contact has numerous advantages and you can probably think of them for India uh, as just as you can for any other country. It has great potential in highly segregated places where it's quite difficult for people to have direct face-to-face -face contact. It works particularly well where opportunities for contact are low. It makes the best use of cross-group friendships because a friendship between two people can be shared widely. And if you think of the initial idea of right, you then go into the related ideas of vicarious contact where people, I don't know if you have any soap operas in, in India, like of the, I know you have many soap operas in India, I don't know whether you have any soap operas of the type where members of distinct social groups become friends and they, they perform their friendship in front of an audience of millions and millions of people. We have some famous examples in American TV, in British, there's a very famous example in the US called Will and Grace. Do you know Will and Grace, those of you? Uh, I was gonna say the students will know it, but I'm glad to see it's not just the students, but Will and Grace models the friendship between gay and straight people and it has been shown to be associated with more tolerant attitudes. As I said, extended contact should, in principle, be less likely to induce intergroup anxiety, although that's not an, an effect that has been widely replicated. Uh, we did a study, uh, finally, of, on 20 years' worth uh, of, of research on Steve Wright's hypothesis. We found that there's a small, small to medium relationship between extended contact and intergroup attitudes, which is actually about the same size as the effect for direct contact and as in direct contact you should really be partialing out the effect of extended contact which really means that somebody needs to go all the way back to Pettigrew and Tropp's meta-analysis and take all those studies that have uh, indirect or extended contact and partial that out statistically. So you're looking here at a pure effect of extended contact. Do the effects of contact generalize? My history of intergroup contact goes all the way back to being an undergraduate student at the University of Bristol, taught by Henri Tajfel and John Turner and Howard Giles, leading figures in the development of social identity theory. And I can still remember John Turner's lectures to us saying, basically, intergroup contact doesn't work. And that was my view until some years later. Um, the reason that people thought that it didn't work is that it didn't generalize. And when we talk about generalization, there have been three types that we've looked at. The first is, does it generalize across situations? You might be friends within the university with a person who belongs to a different social group, but you come from different states, you live in different parts of town, and your relationship is strictly geographically constrained. I, together with Rupert Brown, focused on the second type of generalization, which is that you may have a unique friend in the outgroup, but that doesn't bring about a change towards the view of the outgroup as a whole. In studies of American prejudice, 
um, and this, this same pattern is found through literary texts as well, that you'll find characters say, I'm not a racist, some of my best friends are, and those best friends will be black people or rather ruder expressions of, of that term um, that are acceptable today. People use it as a way of holding up their credentials and say, I can't possibly be prejudiced because I have a close friend. Well, you can be. And the third type is this secondary transfer effect, identified much more recently by Thomas Pettigrew in 1997, the idea that contact with members of one group may have knock-on effects or trickle-down effects towards other groups. Let's look at the secondary transfer effect. I mentioned knock-down uh, knock or knock-on or trickle-down <coughs> effects. Economists um, talk about trickle-down economics. This is this idea that if you put more money in the pockets of people who've already got loads of money, it will have some trickle-down effects towards other people. I'm not an economist, but I understand that, that that view is widely challenged today. But in contact, it does seem that it has some effect. So this is a very simple demonstration of what's involved. If you have contact with members of Group A, what you'd expect is that will bring about a more positive attitude towards Group A. The idea of secondary transfer effect is that that will have trickle-down effects towards your attitude towards uh, out-group B. And we tested this, and sorry, the reason this matters, this is a very tiny graphic over, over here, is just to remind me to say why this matters. That's a little pie chart of an area of London that shows all the different ethnic groups and national groups that live in that area. And that's an area called Newham in East London, which has about 140 nationalities represented. So if contact were purely an individual approach and only worked with one individual outgroup, then if you took a white person out of that larger slice of the pie, that white person would, in theory, need to have interactions with a member of 140 different groups, which is not very plausible as a social intervention. So we tested this idea in, in one of many studies. We tested it in Northern Ireland where we measured, first of all, attitudes to the ethno-religious outgroup. So that's Protestants' attitudes towards Catholics, for example. We measured contact in the neighborhood with the ethno-religious outgroup. So how much contact do you have with Catholics or Protestants um, in the neighborhood? And we controlled for contact with and attitudes to ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities represent a very small portion of people in Northern Ireland. At the time of our research, only about 5%. So it's very unlikely to have any contact with that group. But we could show in a large longitudinal study of a representative sample of adults, we could show the, that contact with the, F, with the religious outgroup uh, had a direct effect on attitudes to the secondary outgroup, but the strongest effect is mediated by, in, in one example case, contact with Protestants, changing attitudes to Protestants, which changes attitudes to racial and ethnic minorities. The contextual effect of contact is the third indirect type of contact, and this is the idea that if contact is an individual level approach, how on earth do we scale it up? People in, in, in government always ask the question, if you're posing a social intervention, how do you scale it up to millions or even billions of people? So do you really have to ensure that every individual from one group has direct face-to-face -face personal contact with an individual from every one of the other groups? What role could the wider context play in this? And one way of looking at this is to ask the question, does it matter where you live? Does it matter, and if you think of extreme examples, does it matter if you're living in the American South in the 1950s with all those social norms and attitudes that surround you, or does it matter if you live in the liberal North on the East Coast? Of course you'd say it should matter. So how do you test that hypothesis? Well, if you just think of the two individuals who live in those different places, you'd think that they would differ in their prejudice. And this, this effect, this contextual effect, refers to any kind of social context. So you can scale it up. Kids in a school class 
where they have more liberal schoolmates will be more positive in their attitudes. People who are in a particular school where the attitudes are more liberal will have more liberal attitudes, and it scales up through cities and regions and, and even countries. And the contextual effect is very precisely is the idea, it's a very strong prediction, it's the idea that this <coughs> contact at the neighborhood or at the contextual level will have even more influence than the interpersonal contact. So how do you test this? We did this in a, a, a very ambitious paper which used five large cross-sectional data sets, weak, no evidence of causal influence at all, so on, um, two large longitudinal data sets. We should say about the longitudinal set, sets, because this is a, a, often something that is misunderstood, we had many, many d good discussions about this when a developmental psychologist joined our lab. And he got us all to think about the way developmental psychologists think about causality. And of course, even a longitudinal study can't give you evidence about causality. The true fundamentalist position in science is that you have to do an experiment. You have to do random allocation. One, you randomly allocate some people to receive contact, some people don't. Only that kind of design can really give you causal information. And we can have, if you like, a brief philosophical statistical discussion about that. But like it or not, that's the way journal editors and reviewers work. So none of the longitudinal data gives you causal evidence, but it gives you more greater confidence in your causal conclusions. So what you do is you sample people from different contexts. In that paper, we sampled from different regions in one study, from different districts in another, from different neighborhoods in another. We have studies that all include the key <coughs> measures. You must have a measure of contact. You must have a measure of prejudice. And we tested this contextual effect while controlling for a range of other things that normally are associated with prejudice, like demographic factors, education, gender, etc. I'll give you just one illustration from one of the simple cross-sectional studies. We used the European Social Survey. I just clicked on my Guardian News app this morning and the European Social Survey is reported on the front page uh, showing that uh, apparently British people ha now have very positive attitudes towards immigration. A little bit too late, unfortunately, having decided to withdraw the country from the EU on the basis that they didn't like foreigners. Um, so this, this allows you access to fantastic amounts of data. You can see there you've got over 30,000 participants uh, from 21 European countries. So what you do in the study is you basically do a, something called a multi-level modeling analysis. And you create within-level and between-level parts of your analysis. And the within-level is the bit that we in psychology normally focus on. It's the individual level. The between-level is scaling things up so you consider all the people in each of the different neighborhoods. And you find at the individual level, you get the expected negative correlation, negative association between contact and prejudice. You also get that effect albeit much more strongly at the between level. And when you test the difference between those two, you get this contextual level, which is telling you that that effect is significantly stronger at the between level than at the within level. Why is this important? It gives us confidence that contact is something that we can scale up. It's not just an individual level plaster to go over the cut. It's something much more wide ranging and useful. What we also showed in those studies was evidence for how contact works. This, again, goes back to Gordon Allport's work where he, he put a huge emphasis on norms. And actually, we could show in four of the seven studies where we had a measure of norm, and these were not really where we had a measure of, of norms. It's where the data that we could find, some of which was ours, some of which was available in secondary data sets, had a measure of norms, you could show that higher levels of contact were associated with more tolerant norms, and those tolerant norms were associated with more positive attitudes. The third lesson is that contact helps explain the mixed effects of societal diversity. So this goes back to 
uh, a very famous and provocative article that um, Robert Putnam wrote, published in 2007, in which he argued that diversity, in his case he was really talking about ethnic diversity, diversity was positively associated with threat. So regions of the US where diversity was higher, people felt threatened, and this had an, a not negative impact on their levels of trust. And he distinguished between three levels of trust, trust in ethnic outgroups, trust in your ethnic in-group, and trust in people who live in the same neighborhood as you. He did, however, very carefully argue that short-term diversity might be a challenge, as his data showed, but he was more optimistic long-term, saying that he thought it might be an advantage. Unfortunately, the short-term prediction grabbed all of the attention, and this, was, this has led to re really big debates in sociology and political science. We retested his controversial idea by saying, you don't need to look just at diversity and just at threat, and just at trust. What's the missing variable? Contact. So if you do a study, which we then did, a large-scale social survey, where you recruit people from many different parts of the country, in this case in the UK, living in areas that ranged in deprivation and ranged in diversity, you then can predict that diversity will offer an opportunity for contact. If people pick up that opportunity for contact, they will then show lowered levels of threat and then they will show higher levels of trust. We tested that idea in another of these multi-level modeling designs. Here I'm going to show you just the between level for simplicity. We could show that diversity measured in, in the society uh, at each of the neighborhood levels is associated with intergroup contact, but it's also uh, negatively associated. I'm sorry, that top of my graph has disappeared here, but it should show two negative effects, one without group trust and one with trust in neighbors. So as Putnam predicted, those negative associations do uh, appear. But if you include contact in your model, contact is associated with reduced threat and reduced threat is then connected to each of those three types of trust and to attitudes. So in, in short, contact is the missing variable in Putnam's analysis. And we then tried to show that in uh, another study. I'm just got a little bit confused about my timing here because of the introductory uh, amount. So when would you like me to finish? In terms of for people who have to leave, when would you like me to finish? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Right. So in that case, I'm going to skip this next study because that was simply a, simply a second explanation of, uh, of, of another study at the, at the level um, of, the, of diversity. And I'm going to now jump to lesson four, which is where we need to consider the joint effects of not just positive but also negative contact. This is work that is not yet published, um, being uh, conducted with my longtime collaborator Miguel Ramos and, and one of his students, Mogra Unesa. Um, sorry, Unesa Mogra. Um, and um, what we're looking at here is the idea that diversity doesn't just increase opportunities for positive contact but increases opportunities for negative contact. Ethnic minorities, we know, disproportionately face health inequalities, and they tend to have lower life satisfaction and worse health. There are multiple factors involved here, but we ask the question, could positive contact play any kind of a protective role uh, against those negative experiences? And we tested this effect in a series of studies focusing on minority group members in different societies. We, I'll show you one illustration from a study we did in London. London is a very diverse city. Over 40% of its residents are identified with a minority ethnic group. And what we did was a cross-sectional study. Well, we didn't do it. We used the data from a cross-sectional study, um, which has a measure of contact. 
It has a measure of discrimination and it has a measure of life satisfaction, something that's pretty widely correlated with health outcomes. What you can show in that graph is that when negative contact, at the very bottom of the figure here, when negative contact is high, but frequent contact, um, the positive contact is low, it's minus one standard deviation lower, um, the life satisfaction scores are lower. But if people have those same high experiences of negative contact, but also high levels of contact, then their health, their, their life satisfaction score is uplifted. So it appears to support what we call this protection effect, which we've also been able to replicate in three other studies. Lesson five is the value of social networks. And social network analysis is taking us away from an individual approach and moving us towards a dyadic and a network perspective. So what matters isn't any individual single view, but how that individual interacts with other people. In short, SNA focuses on interdependencies. This is the idea that we are interdependent social beings. Our health is dependent on those around us. Our wealth is dependent on those around us. In famous examples, our, our susceptibility to heart attack is dependent on the health of those around us. There have been many famous studies. So suddenly, this appears to be something that's incredibly useful for intergroup contact because you can look at a social network and you can plot the direct and the indirect relationships between people in a network. We use the approach here to distinguish between two different effects, and the, the, we call them contact effects and socialization effects. The contact effect is the idea that if you have friends, sorry, that if you have friends who are in the out group, you are more likely to have a positive attitude, a lower level of prejudice. The socialization effect, much more popular in developmental psychology, says your social attitudes, by and large, are strongly influenced by the attitudes of your friends. Nobody has ever pitted these two positions against each other. And that's partly for methodological reasons. And social network analysis actually provides you with a way around that problem. You disentangle the, the contact effect and the socialization effect. So we did this in another uh, longitudinal social network study. We carried this out in schools in Oldham, uh, in the northwest of England. This is a, a town on, in Greater Manchester, as we always say, including the people from Oldham. Nobody's ever heard of Oldham, but Oldham is in Greater Manchester, and everybody's heard of Manchester. Um, we got these two schools, which reflect both the diversity of the city and the extent of segregation in the city, because they're both Asian majority schools and white minority schools. We took every student in year groups seven, eight, and nine, so they're for aged from 11 at the bottom to 14 at the top. They were invited to participate. As I was saying to someone the other day, schools are great places to do research because you have an almost captive audience. You could get them to complete these surveys over the school year with six to eight week gaps between the waves, and you measure friendship nominations, and you measure outgroup attitudes. The other beautiful thing about social network analysis, although the outcome is tremendously complicated, the, the, the statistical part of it, the input is tremendously simple. All you have to do is get a child in a class to list their five best friends, or their 10 best friends, or their 15 best friends. And you do that without any reference to ethnicity, which is even better, because you avoid socially desirable responding. So you've got your sample of just over 1,000 students, boys and girls, Asians and whites, and you've got three year groups and two schools. Now, you find the obvious things first, just to, just to contextualize the study. If you look at friends, the uh, number of friends, you have far more in-group friends than out-group friends. <coughs> That's to be expected. You also have slightly more positive in-group attitudes than out-group attitudes. People nowadays, are sometimes reluctant to express negative out-group attitudes. So it's, uh, the, the beauty, the value of assessing in-group and out-group attitudes is that you can assess this difference between them as a bias score. 
the beauty of social network analysis, though, is it allows you to do these wonderful plots, which plot segregation. And these are just examples. If you have circles denoting girls, squ little squares denoting boys, blue for white British and red for Asian British, you can see uh, that for all six networks, one network being each of the three-year groups at both school one at the top and school two at the bottom, you can see immediately a level of segregation in those networks. And what is interesting, when you think about people who say they want to cut down segregation, what you also see pretty clearly is that you get a better understanding of what friendship segregation means when you see that boys and girls are heavily segregated. It's not just Asian and white British people who are segregated. So the strategy in this research is to, over five different waves, conduct a longitudinal analysis of the changes in these social networks. And I'm not going to show you the, the complicated output, but just to show you the key finding of that research. We found, as you would expect from the contact literature, that having more outgroup friends is predictive of a more positive outgroup attitudes when examined in isolation. That's the bit the contact hypothesis has analyzed for 50 odd years. Now you add in the new bit and you say, but, okay, contact is there. What if I now introduce the variable of my friend's attitudes towards the outgroup? And what you can show then uh, is that there's stronger evidence, and it pains me greatly as a contact hypothesis theorist to have to admit that, you find that contact lost on this occasion. It's the attitudes of your in-group friends that are the stronger effect. But all is not lost for the contact hypothesis because you then clearly need to change the attitudes of your out-group friends. How do you do that? Through intergroup contact. So it's merely giving us a more profound understanding of the value of contact and where it needs to work. Last two things briefly. We have tested contact under the most challenging conditions. And we did this in a, a study also published, so I can just mention it briefly. Identifying the boundary conditions of any theory is a fundamentally important part of of the philosophy of science. Whatever area you're working on, you've found this exciting effect, what you need to do is you need to test it. You need to test it under demanding conditions. And through giving hundreds of papers at hundreds of conferences, I've got used to people saying, but, but, does it work in Israel? Does it work in Northern Ireland? Does it work in Cyprus? All places where I have worked and shown that it does work. But two ideas have come up. One is the idea, well, this thing is pretty unlikely to work when people feel high levels of threat. And the other thing is, and there's one paper published on it, this is actually unlikely to work for minority group members who've suffered high levels of discrimination. Well, we got together all the studies that we had done on this topic. We sent it off for review, and a friendly editor said, sorry guys, we need you to go off and find every study ever done, including all these bits of data. So we went and trawled and did a full meta-analysis, picked up a handful of extra studies, did our meta-analysis, and we could show that neither threat nor discrimination had an impact on the efficacy of contact. If you look at the effect sizes for people who are low or high on threat, low or high on discrimination, they're almost identical. So you've, what you've done here is you've tested contact under the most demanding of conditions and found that it passes the test. Level, lesson seven, the final thing, is just to look very briefly at <coughs> an incredibly ambitious intervention that was planned in Northern Ireland, not by us, um, but by an external organization, but we got to come in and evaluate it. And they introduced the idea to, uh, of a, a learning intervention. Um, so we got to come in, and, and our analysis of their intervention is about as complicated as it gets. So this is a quasi-experimental five-year longitudinal study. As they say sometimes on those adverts, folks don't do this at home. Um, school kids in Northern Ireland first tested annually over three years, from 11 to 14, longitudinally. At that point, year 10, 
the intervention comes in, and it's called sharing education. After year 10, some of the kids in some of the schools become part of the program where they take some of their lessons with members of a different religion school down the road. So if you can imagine this happening in India, you can probably imagine some parallel version of this. Um, the people who, who make the rules for schools in the UK, and I remember back to all those years when I was a school kid, um, they're really intelligent people because what they do is not only do they send you to different schools or your parents send you to different schools, but they dress you in school uniforms. So if you want to know whether to beat up a Catholic kid or beat up a Protestant kid, it's very, very easy. You just see what color jacket they're wearing. And as a kid, I can remember being on the wrong end of some of those uh, altercations. So SCP, the Sharing Education Program, gives some of the kids the chance to mix like this. And what we did is we sought to estimate how effective the program was in fostering social integration. We then continued with two more years of survey after the intervention, and we compared the attitudes of those who participated and those who did not. So you've got over 6,000 students, 69 schools spread out over the country, five surveys, about half the students participated, and we had a, a number of measures. And I'll give you the bad news first. The bad that is, we, is this program does not bring about change on all the measures. Welcome to the real world. That's, that's like life doing research in the real world. We have a measure of contact. The first thing we want to know is, has this intervention created higher levels of contact outside the school? That's already quite a demanding criterion. Then we want to know, uh, have attitudes and trust improved? These are what we call proximal outcomes. Have the mediators been changed? Is there greater empathy? Is there lower anxiety? And we also measured some <coughs> more distal outcomes, which I won't go into today. We found that participating in the program had a medium-sized positive effect on the amount of intergroup contact outside of class. So that's already good. Anybody planning a social intervention would, would shake your hand for that and say, that's great, I'm happy with that. Over time, if you look at all the different measures that, that we've looked at, eight years, eight, nine, ten is the intervention, and you see an increase in contact with the outgroup outside of school following the intervention. We also found positive changes in outgroup attitudes and trust, quite small effect sizes. We didn't find effects on any of the other measures. So again, changes in attitudes, changes in trust, and changes, not changes in the other ones. How do we put those results into perspective? They're quite modest. And this is why we talked about significance levels and we talked about effect sizes. If you break this effect size down, it would mean if the program were rolled out to all the kids in all the schools that, that were currently segregated in Northern Ireland, about 10% of students would increase their outgroup trust. That doesn't sound like very many, you know. But if you multiply that upwards, that would lead to an improvement in trust and attitudes for thousands of kids who would then interact with other people and change their attitudes. They would model contact for other people and those multiplier effects could come in. But it is a large scale social intervention. Nobody in their PhD gets to do a study on 69 different schools in the country. It's very, very rare that we do these kind of studies. And what you realize in the real world is that you have to look at what is called the fidelity of an intervention, by which we mean the degree to which an intervention is delivered as intended. And this is the gap between the laboratory world and the real world. It turns out that in some of those schools that should have had SCP, they got a pretty weak version of it. Some people in some schools had much more of it than other people did, although they were both supposed to have had the same. So all this contributes noise. So your small effect size is having an effect despite this noise. Remember back to the Pettigrew and Trott meta-analysis, you get the largest effect size in the most rigorous study. We've tried to be as rigorous as we possibly could with the intervention, but I don't think the original intervention has been as rigorous as it, as it could have been. Conclusions. 
I certainly feel, when I look back over my career, I certainly feel I've learned some important lessons and like extended contact, I've shown those lessons to other people and they've learned from it and they've gone on to build their careers uh, and do new and ever more wonderful studies. I hope that you have the feeling that you've learned something today and I hope especially for those of you who are not in the psychology in-group that I haven't talked over your heads and I've, I've made the key bits of it accessible to you. I th I've tried to portray a development from Allport's modestly named contact hypothesis in 1954 to what we're now calling an integrative theory of intergroup contact, which is something much more ambitious, tested in much more detail. We have robust, wide-reaching effects of contact. They are sometimes small, they are sometimes medium, they face immense challenges uh, when tested in, in uh, the most rigorous conditions, but we can still show that they have effects. Contact has strange it, and, and really quite wonderful indirect effects, which Allport never envisaged. And we have a theory now that does, doesn't just occupy a position in social psychology. I collaborate with political scientists, I collaborate with sociologists, and it's become a kind of social science theory, as it should be, uh, given the issues that it addresses. And it's become a, a key aspect of social science that has policy impact uh, and is a key aspect, I would argue, of almost any intervention aimed at reducing prejudice. Very finally, the critics remain. I constantly have to, to react to the new wave of criticisms and, and I feel sometimes you know, that it's great, it's exhausting, but it constantly makes the theory better. We go out and do new things. However, I don't think the assessment of contact is always fair. If you were to go out this afternoon and look up this, this word on, uh, on a literature search, you'd find some very critical papers out there, not all of which carefully read the literature or carefully um, describe what was done and what was found. And I came across <coughs> something called the Hans Rosling effect, which is a, an effect um, that refers to a Swedish epidemiologist. He's recently written this book called Factfulness. And he goes through a whole series of things where we tend to have a rather negative view of the, the world, like vaccination doesn't work, for example. And then you look at the data, vaccination has been absolutely fantastic. It's been incredibly effective. And I think contact falls into the same sort of pattern, that given the challenges of reducing prejudice, it's actually done very well. It's not exactly picked an easy topic. Prejudice has been around for a very, very long time. Trying to reduce prejudice on a wide level is, is very difficult. I'm going to end up with that old quotation uh, attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. I feel quite passionately that academia is very much focused on everybody coming up with their new theory, everyone coming up with their, their own thing, you know, like medical students all dream of inventing, finding a new disease. Sometimes I think you need some of us to actually stand on the shoulders of giants and just say, let's get a better understanding of what somebody has done before me, already found to be very important, uh, and let's see if we can make things better that way. And to end with, a, with another quotation, uh, uh, the, the poet W. H. Auden wrote that some books are undeservedly forgotten, none are undeservedly remembered. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions and answers. I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so subtyping and subgrouping refer to a, to a related topic of stereotype change, which I also worked on at some point. And actually that work was very much influenced by Gordon Allport's work because he referred to exceptions 
that we have contact with an individual and it's very easy to make that individual into an exception. We subtype them from the group as a whole. So essentially that work feeds directly into this idea that when we have contact it needs to be with people who are to some extent typical of their group, representative of their group. Categories need to be salient. You did talk about category salience also. Yes. Another thing, just wondering, although you have presented a lot of longitudinal work, mm -hmm. but I mean, real-time contact is not so simple. You have mentioned that also. So it's like I was wondering if one goes five steps further, the kind of happenings that happen, you come back four steps. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was wondering. Can you say a little bit more about what, what, what you mean? You know, if the contact is positive, for example, mm -hmm. one goes further, let's say five steps, mm -hmm. but then something else happens because it's an overall scenario that we are talking yes. about. Yeah. And then we come back again. Yes. Because <coughs> it is very easy, a lot of work has shown that it's easy to come back to the attitudes that we already have. Yes. No, that's a very, very deep and important question. Thank, thank you for it. That's why we've, we've done this, the longitudinal work and sometimes we've gone back to much more granular levels. So we, we, we've also done some work with diaries. And I was saying to the students yesterday that getting people to fill out these daily diaries seems to be very, very difficult. But if somebody's looking for a, you know, a really important area to work in, there are studies available. Um, and I think that's very important because you, you could find, if you do this over a longer enough period, you'll find that somebody is establishing a more positive attitude towards the outgroup, and then they hit the wall. They have an encounter with a member of the outgroup, and it's very negative. But this is where the work on the protective effect comes in, that I think if you build up enough credit with the positive effect, then you are able to see a similar kind of subtyping, but it's a subtyping of the affective nature of the contact. You say, well, my contact is broadly positive. Of course you will meet, meet the occasional idiot in every group. But then for critical decisions, people come back to their attitude. Yes, absolutely. And, and, uh, I don't know how one can study that. But yeah. in my discussions, I teach social cognitions. Mm. In my discussions, you know, in real life scenarios, this has come up. Yeah. No, well, it's, it's obvious that in your, your teaching, your students are very lucky because you're thinking very, very deeply about this. And I, I think that's where the studies on stereotyping, for example, uh, under cognitive load would be very important. It would be very interesting to see, uh, and, and there is some evidence that, that people fall back on their stereotypes more when they're under cognitive load. If you put them in a scanner and you get them doing complicated tasks, you know, you can see different patterns of brain activity. We have done some work uh, on neuroprocessing as well. We've been able to show some association between contact and, and, and neural processing. But you just, it's like with anything else. I mean, I think a, you can go to a hospital um, and a doctor can carry out life-saving surgery, maybe for diabetes, for example, and he's going to tell you or she is going to tell you that you've now got to go home and you've got to change your diet and you've got to change your lifestyle. And if you don't do those things, then you're going to go, come back to that same surgeon again with the same problem. I don't think contact is a static thing. I think it's a dynamic thing. Just very brief final point. When I didn't talk about this, this work today, but one of the, the important pieces of work I feel I've done was to study a social intervention of, of two different schools. And one was uh, both in Oldham. Uh, one was an almost exclusively white British school. The other was almost exclusively Asian British school. And the, because of the riots in this city in 2001, they decided that they needed to do something about it. And they planned one new school. And they planned it in an area equidistant from the, 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 the different segregated areas. And they basically took a pint of milk over here and a pint of Guinness over here, and they poured them together into this new school. We were able to find out about this. I went to see the relevant people, and I said, we're doing this project in Oldham anyway. Can we study this school? And that's been published in Developmental Psychology. We're, and we are able to track these people over five years. And we could show that it did have an effect. It's not simple. 
you've got to track people over time, but it is worth doing. And one of the, just before we did that study, I addressed all the teachers of the two current schools before the new school. And one of the teachers, uh, who was an Asian British teacher, and he put his, he stood up and he said to me, do you really think this is worth doing, this school? We live in a segregated town, we are in a segregated country, there's prejudice. For a few years of their life, you're going to throw these kids together. And I thought, oh dear, how do I answer this? And on the, spontaneously, I said to him, next question, is that right? Next yeah. question. I, I said to him, can I ask you, sir, what do you teach? And he said, I teach mathematics. And I said to him, you know, at school, I hated mathematics. I was bad at mathematics. I really struggled with mathematics. And only later in my life did I realize how important it was. I think the same is true here. Any experience in your life that you have, however brief, where you get to see members of different groups, interact with them, I think, you know, there's a famous, famous classical quotation. I, th I think it's, somebody will correct me, maybe. I think it's Thucydides. And some, he says, you never walk into the same river twice. <laughs> Sir. Sorry, thank you so much for your question. I hope we'll get to, thank you. I hope we get to talk later. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm not a psychologist. This is uh, I've got a basic uh, question. How do you define a group, actually? I was wondering throughout your presentation. Uh, because sociologically, we have little constraints with regard to defining a group. Mm -hmm. uh, I do understand from your presentation, so you are talking about predominantly minority groups. Um, but then, uh, can you make generalizations about other groups based on these observations? And who is the member of a group? Uh, is it just by virtue of being born in a family, can I be classified as a Hindu or a Christian, and therefore I belong to the group? Or this is called objective uh, belonging, mm. there is a subjective belonging. Do yeah. I really share the consciousness of the group? So uh, if that way, can we really make generalizations? So <coughs> your longitudinal studies or large number of studies that you have inside can make generalizations. Uh, I would like to see uh, if can you look into the very definition of group uh, and if we accept this definition of differentiations, uh, so generalizations will be tenable. Very good question. As I said, as I said in my um, in my lecture, you have to be very careful when people say some of my best friends are, but some of my best friends are sociologists, and I even work with them and have published papers with them. So we know we've, we've had these interesting intellectual debates. The question about the definition of a group, the, the way I define it is the way that social identity <laughs> defines it, which is a cognitive definition. A person is a member of a group if they perceive themselves as being a member of the group. That's the, that's the basic definition that we work with. In many of these studies, we, ha we have also measures of identification with the group. We've sometimes used that measure as a moderator of the, of the effects. And these are important things to consider. What you're looking at in this top-down, bird's-eye view is you're looking about a robust effect that appears across all these different studies. And these are just my studies. You know, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies published in the meta-analysis and since the meta-analysis. So when you say that, that I've looked just at minority groups, I've of course looked at, at, at the majority minority, minority relationships. So I've looked at how majority group members view minorities and vice versa. And some of those issues are specific to one group and the other group. So in the meta-analysis that we did of, of threatening potentially not threatening, challenging, potentially challenging factors for the, for the contact hypothesis. The first is threat. Well, it's primarily members of majority groups who feel realistic threat from minorities. They feel that their new migrants in the UK will take away their jobs, drive down wages, and so on. And it's primarily minority members uh, who suffer discrimination. So some of the, the aspects that we've taken have been tailor-made for one group or the other group. Uh, Professor, I agree, uh, in case of a minority situation, this is fine, I and mean, they may behave in a similar way, 
that uh, you cannot, it's very difficult to make a similar observation about the member of the majority group. Because it's difficult to say whether they really make a group or not, because we treat them as quasi groups. Groups and quasi groups. So, uh, you know, the sharing, the level of consciousness is very unequal. In case of India, you see, we don't have racial groups, but we have, you may have religious groups. Mm -hmm. You may have, you know, but the religious groups, if you say Hindu, Muslim, they are highly divided a uh, lot, actually. And the level of sharing the consciousness is also very, you know, lopsided, ups and downs, etc. Mm -hmm. So difficult to draw over the line. That's one way. Uh, <coughs> So we call them actually quasi-groups. So oh, unless you identify, uh, first of all, uh, a set of people who share the same level of consciousness, it would be difficult for us to classify them as a group. So I would disagree fundamentally with, with that point. They don't need to share the same level. That's like saying every single one of the people in this group must if identify. Level, if you just let me, if you just let me, if you just let me finish my point, not everybody in the group needs to identify six on a seven-point scale. They can have a level of identification, right. and only when there is a level of range can you use it as a moderating or as a correlating. Okay. Then, if you say they share at least five points, then only you can classify them. Yeah, yeah. So, if not ten out of ten, but at least five out of uh, at least five out of ten, then you can. Uh, yeah. We we'll move to the next question because of possibly your professor Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm also a sociologist, and we are thinking of stubbornly rooted in the real life. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, you know, like it's kind of not fair to kind of present the Indian data, but I was wondering whether we have seen this book by Ashutosh Varshney. Yes, yes. It also has, I think, a similar... Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I would love to have time, maybe this visit, maybe next visit, to talk about these, these things together with you, with you for India. And I'm really open to criticisms of the approach. That's how you learn. So if, you know, but I'm practical. So if you tell me that we've got to have a measure of group consciousness, then I've got to say to you, well, get me a measure of group consciousness. You know, we, we simplify things. We say, okay, actually what we think is group identification. We have measured that. We have included that. Varshney's work, I, like many other people, was, thank you for your comments. I was really fascinated by it when it appeared. I understood that it's subsequently been subjected to a number of challenges. Uh, and I actually did collect with one of my graduate students, uh, I collected some data uh, from, it was cross-sectional data, from two different studies, that, two different cities that were supposed to be in, in his areas. And we actually found a considerable level of variance within each city. So I actually think it's too problematic to talk about you know, one whole city being a, being a tolerant city and another whole city being an intolerant city. Um, but, I, but I think broadly, um, he, his work made a very important contribution by saying, and that's something that I didn't talk about today, for example, it, it's, it's that integration needs to be part of organizational life. So it, those would be perhaps the settings that a sociologist would be more likely to work in. As I recall, he talked about looking at, at community-level organizations that people belong to. You might belong, for example, to, to a group of people involved in a certain trade or people involved in education, and you might have intergroup encounters in that setting. And I think that's very important. I'd love to know what, what the contemporary view of Varshini's work is in India. Yeah, it's a similar criticism, as you pointed out. And uh, you mentioned the Romeo and Juliet story, and I was thinking that uh, when you have contact, intergroup contact, and that kind of turns into an intergroup marriage or a romantic mm. relationship. So that is that happens to be the kind of starting point of all intergroup conflict in the Indian scenario. Because we have concept of love jihad and yes. you know, so what's yeah. the nature of that contact, I think yeah. it's very important. So the professional contact vis-a-vis -vis the marriage and uh, 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 what kind of leaks into the meaning yeah. of the community. You know, I think, it, I, I think it's, I, I'd love to know. Um, you know, when you travel, you sort of realize, gosh, you know, I don't know. I mean, if people have done a study in India and it's published in social psychology journals, I'll know about it. But, you know, if somebody's written an elegant book 
in sociology I might not know about it. You know, so I'd love to, to hear about it. But I mean, to give you a, a, an autobiographical example, so I ha happen to be married to a German lady. Now, when my future wife met my grandmother the first time, this is my grandmother whose husband had been badly gassed in the war between the UK and Germany. And she said to my mother, not to me, she said to my mother, well, Claudia is a very nice girl, but would Miles really marry a German? You know, so we're not a million miles away from you. Now, we've been happily married for 38 years. Um, if our marriage had broken up after two years, what kind of attributions would people be making? Ah, oh, well, you see, you can't mix wine and water or whatever, you know. Um, so I, I think it would be, I'd love to know. I mean, some, I bet you somebody has done research on this, uh, and, and maybe you know about it, but I bet you somebody will have studied um, cross-group marriages. Yeah. And, and marriages are the highest level. They're, they're the most challenging because of all these kind of things, because in some I'm very aware that in some families, to, to take this bold step is to exclude yourself from your current family. And that's a very, very brave step. You know, nobody said to me that if you marry this person, we will never speak to you again. I mean, what the, I'm a Protestant, an Anglican by tradition, my wife is a Catholic. And what typically happens when you marry across those groups is that you have to uh, uh, you have to agree to bring up the children Catholic. So I've been working on religion-based family laws and uh, how the institution of marriage is seen in India, which mm. is I think uh, would be quite different from <coughs> the Western context. Yeah. And at three o'clock, actually today we have another talk on dispute and conflict resolution. So I should try to come. <laughs> of, uh, legal pluralism. I think yeah. Really Religion is really, really important in this too. I mean, obviously, religion comes in to some extent in my work in Northern Ireland. Although, it turns out that when you study that conflict, which most of you will think is a religious conflict, it's not a religious conflict at all. It's a political conflict. You know, large numbers of those people don't have any strong re religious groups. They vote for people of the same religion. They live in areas of the same religion. But th they read different newspapers. They, they follow different sports and different sports teams. But it's not a theological dispute over one kind of religion or another. And, and, I, and I think they're fascinating. Yeah. It has to do with inheritance law. Yes. Yes, yes. Can yes. come to the next question? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, thank you, Professor Yusuf, for a very nice talk. Uh, something probably in need of the hour, uh, especially in our country. But I will leave that uh, aside. A uh, couple of questions. So you talked at length about contact and you know the benefits it sort of uh, seems to bring. And as you said, it even uh, stands the critical test of you know when uh, certain groups are being threatened by the other. Uh, I was wondering about the motivation for contact and how do you create uh, something like that? Because a lot of times you you know you can put two groups together. Uh, but there has to be some motivation between mm. them to uh, actually come in contact and yeah. interact in a certain way. Yeah. So have, have some studies looked about that and uh, you know, what are the outcomes for this? Yeah, um, I think that's a really important point. It's, it's not something that we have looked at um, in our research, but I think it is important. And one of the things I, I learned through um, going to give many public talks to people and to, to government officials and so on. And some, somebody uh, who was working in a, in a grassroots community organization, he said to me, you know, we've learned um, that you never get people from the two groups together for a Tuesday evening when it's raining in November to talk about getting to know members of the other group. But you get them together when somebody's threatening to take away the local hospital. You get them together when there's a dispute about not enough parking spaces in the street. So you look for shared interests. And I think that's Varshney's work, uh, is where that connects again to that. Um, and, and so you know, this, this is also a key, the contact is not the only game in town. You know, it relates to Sharif's work on different, different goals, cooperative goals. There are many, many ways uh, in which people should be working together. You know, so if you think of schools, Parents shouldn't be opposing the, a, a new integrated school, for example. They should be saying, what we want for our kids is the best possible form of state education. That's a shared goal that we all have. 
you can accommodate at max one more question. Okay, it's already 12, so just one question. You can, you can ask your questions to me also. <laughs> Thank you. That's yes, can we club one or two questions? Yes, good idea. You had a question. After this, yeah, you can ask, can ask and then... So, I uh, was wondering that uh, since we are putting uh, contact as a measure of creating a better cohesion between the different groups, but uh, I was thinking that we evolutionary, if we go back, why this group come up is also because of the bad instances of the contact. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, related to that and uh, what Nam had initially mentioned, that uh, have we also looked at certain factors that reduce the positive contact, like in terms of the longitudinal studies as well? Uh, Sorry, the, the, have, we, have I looked at? That, that reduce, or any studies that mm. reduce uh, positive contact. If, for example, if in a school setup, there is one in-group student who wants to befriend out-group students, mm -hmm. but then the attitudes of his other in-group friends are a sort of not letting him yeah. fit in his own group, he's not able to do that. So yeah. then there, the positive contact, um, yeah. even if it exists, it will reduce. So factors that probably reduce this. Yes. Uh, yeah. And there was one last question, sir. Oh, thanks. Um, I was thinking if you have looked at contact, contact in terms of social media, because I was yes. reading an article about how Democrats become more entrenched in their views when they come across articles, you know, from the Republicans yes. and yeah. what goes wrong. Yeah. Much of socialization is taking place. Of course, of yeah. course. Great, great questions. I'm going to try and address these all together. Yes, there have been some studies. Uh, if you connect with me through Professor Bushan, I can, I can share some with you. <laughs> It's really important because uh, given that many people get their news this way, they have online friends and so on, it's absolutely important. Uh, I haven't really done much on, on that, but I can connect you to peop people who, who have. Um, the, the questions are great because, because you, know, you, you come and prepare a talk like this and you think, well, okay, what have I learned? And um, then you think, well, so what's going to be the next wave? And you've all got, got ideas about what should be the, the next wave. So I, I've come to think of norms as being really, really important. And so your question about pluralistic ignorance is very important because if people view the norms incorrectly, then they will act accordingly. And, and that's why I think you need to do all these things in a broader context, like I mentioned the TV programs that give examples of contact. Uh, they will all help to change the norms. And our, our norms, I don't know what, what your view of society in India is, but my view of, of society, you know, my father is 95. And I talk to my father about the changes in his life. You know, it, it's sort of unthinkable to him um, that, uh, that, for example, um, an, an ethnic Indian British person could be prime minister. He never imagined that would happen. It's pretty unthinkable to him that my son is gay uh, and, uh, and he's learned to adapt to that. Changes, changes and actually gay, acceptance of gays in our country has been one of the great successes of the social revolution. It's definitely, definitely not solved. I mean, there are still awful people who throw nail bombs in pubs in London which are known to be frequented by gay people. But gay people have made e enormous progress and it's not an issue. It used to be an issue that you lose your job as, a, as an MP or a minister if somebody found out you were gay. So my son is a diplomat. And he said, you know, when he was interviewed, you have to be vetted for this job. And, um, and he said, when that happens, he said, the issue now is not to give anybody a hard time because they're gay. It's simply to protect you against any attempt ever to blackmail you. 
So the, all these things, like you know, the, the heart of British government, I see as a, a much, much more fair and egalitarian and liberal and tolerant than it used to be. And I think people will become aware of these, these, these norms. And I think, I think probably in, in, in a school, the norms are more evident because I think you observe who interacts with whom, who interacts in the playground. But you still get areas. You get areas of segregation. Uh, you get it, so part of the work we didn't talk about at all in the mixed schools. We did some studies in cafeterias at school. Our kids would stay for lunch in school. Um, and we, we, I didn't do it because I'm too old to pass for a, a student, but we, we, we had my undergraduate students doing research projects and they would hide in the, uh, in the school cafeteria with the permission of the school and they had their notebooks and, and they wrote down who sat with whom, when and where. And even in this tolerant community, there is massive spatial segregation at lunchtime. Then you have a whole debate about whether that's a bad thing, whether you should intervene. If your real closest buddies are, are Asian British and you're Asian British, of course you want to sit together with them. But you can still spend lots of other time with them. School is, school is absolutely marvelous. A, a journalist wrote a big piece about our research, which I'm, I'm very proud of because he got my research to many, many people. She, she, she wrote an interview with me for The Guardian, which you can find online. Uh, th actually, that's one of them, and a journalist wrote a piece about the mixed schools, so there's a couple of them. And um, the journalists get to do things that you as a researcher never get to do. You see, he went to the school, he said, would you come with me? He got the head teacher to provide him with a few examples of people who had become friends across the ethnic groups. Which is not, you know, we, we are looking at stuff at a big quantitative level. We're not looking down at the personal level. I will never forget these two sweet little girls, um, one from the Asian British community, one white British. And they came in and talked to us, and, and they giggled a lot. And this guy sort of said, so what, what makes you two friends, you know? And they kind of giggled and said, well, this and that. And they said, and we both love the color purple. <laughs> and he told me, the head teacher told me after they'd gone out, that the, uh, and be careful here because the recording is on. You always forget the recording. But he, he told me that the parent of one of the children had been quite vociferous against the integration of the school. So, you know, you can change things. You can improve things. I don't think I somehow addressed your, your point. Could you remind me what your point was? Uh, I was asking that uh, the creation of the group could also be uh, considered as a result of a contact, the initial contact. Evolutionary, we could say that the bad memories <coughs> or bad result of a contact could be the reason of creation of the Yes, and, and that's why we've tried, as I said, belatedly, to bring in the negative contact. You know, because there, if you, India is the elephant in the room here, okay? I wasn't sure whether to address this you know, or not. But, you know, I read about India, and of course that's media. I read about India when you have an ethnic riot somewhere. But when you have an ethnic riot, what, what is the natural response to that? Is to withdraw to safety and segregation because that's how these divided communities arose in the first place. If you, if you look at Jews and their subjection to pogroms over hundreds of years of history, that's why people withdrew to a place of safety. So ab absolutely. And, and you know, if you have a... Governments are faced with many, many challenging issues. It doesn't always strike people as the, the most important issue. I mean, I think currently social integration has slipped down the agenda in the UK because we have a time of financial austerity, which is totally preoccupying everybody. But when there's another riot, if there is another riot, then it comes back up the agenda. That's the way it works. It's pretty much the case around the world. Isn't it? Yes. Sort of the back. Well, <laughs> well uh, I have been given this opportunity to present my uh, vote of this point, but the entire department. Well, uh, I would like to first of all thank Professor Bruce Bruchan in the fact for bringing Professor Bruce in here. Well, your presentation had one uh, word for a career and what a career it has been. Mm -hmm. In fact, I speak from the point of view of all the researchers, here, particularly the younger researchers, the PhD students. And there is a whole lot of it that has to be taken from your presentation. The one of the spirits uh, which really stands out is uh, the way in which 
you foreground the forefathers and people from where you learned a lot. And that's something that is a huge lesson for all of us. Particularly, we think in terms of uh, finding out something new, we think in terms of uh, going into certain area which have never been entered into by anybody perhaps. That's the research or the path that we do. But not to forget someone who has really you know, brought us to this particular window. That's something that stood out so well. So, Again, from the point of view of uh, you know, this formality, it doesn't remain a formality. <laughs> so on behalf of our department as well as the institute, I thank you so much for thank you. such a wonderful talk. Thank you for your kind words.